going my fellow gentle and of course modern apes i hope this evening finds you well today we're looking at another piece of content by genesis apologetics the uh, semi new creationist organization that has sort of hopped on the scene to to duke it out with the undisputed alphas of of uh, sort of creationism that we find on in the social media and youtube world uh, such as of course ken ham and to a lesser extent uh, kent hovind Genesis Apologetics is led by uh, Dan Biddle. He's the president of, of sort of the whole organization. And so today we're looking at a video by them that covers uh, quite a bit of human evolution. It's an eight-ish, nine-ish minute video um, that has quite a bit wrong with it. I've seen it before, um, but I figured, you know, this, this would be a great opportunity to sort of share with you just how glaring some of their mistakes truly are. Um, which is why we're watching this together. And I'm glad I've got my tea. Um, I'm, I'm still still sort of feeling the rage from the last time that we sat down and covered uh, Genesis Apologetics. So I'm, so my blood pressure is up, I'm ready to go. Um, and, and, and I'm ready to share this experience with you. Now, Genesis Apologetics really rubs me the wrong way. Um, and I can't honestly put my finger on it, particularly why, um, except for it, it could be the fact that that they tell a lot of bold-faced lies. Um, and the reason I say lies rather than sort of misconceptions, as I tend to give the benefit of the doubt, is um, there are quite a few videos that cover almost identical subjects on Genesis Apologetics' YouTube channel. Um, nine videos, to be precise, just on Australopithecus afarensis um, or Lucy. And just actually, mind you, on that individual specimen, uh, not not on any of the other Lucy specimens that we found uh, since uh, Johansson uh, sort of discovered this this original uh, specimen out in in um, uh, the Afar region. Is it the Afar region? Hold on, I can't be messing this up. Oops, I can't be messing this up. The human evolution is my wheelhouse. Let's double check. Where was Lucy? Oh, wait, you can't see this because I'm on a different tab. I'm in my studying tab instead of my Genesis Apologetics tab. Uh, where was Lucy found? The Hadar region. Is it by the Awash? Yeah, it's in Ethiopia. So so the Hadar region, it, it's close. I was close. C cut me a little bit of slack. Um, anyways... Yes, so today this is the video that we're covering. We've got this this beautiful recreation of, of an Australopithecus afarensis here, um, which is great, and I'm sure we're going to hear some very honest representations <laughs> about about that particular um, that particular specimen. I'm sure. So again, sort of the problem with these videos is that it's not just that they're saying the same things; it's also that they're saying the same wrong things over and over and over again. I'm not kidding. Let me show you this here. I'm going to I'm going to take you uh, sort of into my world. Duplicate that tab, back it up. Mm -mm -mm. All right. So, this is their their YouTube channel. We we've, we've been here previously. Um and when you scroll down, we'll kind of go down to the bottom and we'll see just how many videos we can find that have almost the exact same sort of thumbnail and cover the, the exact same subject matter. So we start scrolling up. Lucy's fall from science. Chuck one. Then we have, going up a little bit more, Lucy the Australopithecus debunked in 90 seconds, followed by Lucy the Australopithecus debunked in 11 minutes, followed by Lucy Australopithecus reviewed in 9 minutes, followed by Lucy Australopithecus reviewed in 9 minutes. It's It looks to be almost a, I'm pretty sure it's an exact re-upload. Um, one, of course, has 16,000 views, while the other has not even 700. Um, we continue, is Lucy the Australopithecine an ape to man, blah, blah, blah. I can't see the rest of the title. Keep scrolling up, keep scrolling up. We, we get a nice little uh, respite here before we see Lucy the Australopithecus, missing link or extinct ape? Um, well, first of all, both. But second of all, why, why are we still treading the same water? 
Then we have, of course, this is the one we're looking at today, Genesis Apologetics Tour of the Natural History Museum, which of course is not at all what they cover, um, but that's kind of how I, I stumbled upon it. And then here's another one, Lucy the Australopithecus, Missing Link or Extinct Ape. Now I'm sure you're wondering, Erica, are you planning on covering all of these? And the answer is no, because they tread almost the exact same ground and repeat the same bad tropes constantly. So I won't waste your time, and of course I, I certainly won't uh, waste my time. Um, I picked a moderate length one because I, I thought kind of, you know, what we can only stomach so much of this, uh, you and I. And um, when I was kind of planning on doing this, I, I came to, to bust Genesis Apologetics and eat quite a bit of raw pasta, which as you know, I have quite an affinity for, um, and I'm all out of pasta, which means there's only one thing left to do. And I'm going to be as polite as I can. So we're gonna go ahead and, and, and hop right into this um, with, with the video right here. And wait, hold on, hold on, okay. Here we go. Make sure our volume is appropriate so we can all hear it. And we'll begin. How do you go from hundreds of bone fragments to 47 skeleton bones to a missing link that supposedly lived 3 million years ago named Lucy? Lucy f That's a really, really good question. I think that, you know, surely when we're beginning this, we, we're, we're asking this question, of course, in good faith. Um, of course, it's not disingenuously rhetorical. Um, now, I'm not sure who actually does the narration for this. I know it's the same person that does the narration for the debunking the seven myths or whatever, so I'm not sure if this is Dan Biddle or sort of a sort of a Biddle style lackey. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and refer to this individual as Tate because they're era tating. <laughs> you dick? Okay. So um Tate, I'm so glad you asked how we how we sort of move from that process, uh, the, these bone fragments to to uh, a missing link, um, a species, so to speak, because missing link is really sort of a dead term. It's it's very easy to misconstrue. Now, a good paleontologist is, of course, capable of assembling bones um, due to their training in anatomy. So if you if you are, of course, a paleontologist, you've had to take numerous courses in anatomy and probably physiology as well um, in order to know just how muscles attach to various sites on the bone surfaces, as well as how the bones fit together and how to identify them in the field. Because the cool thing about living mammals is we share sort of a sort of a homology with regard to, to our, our structures. I'm sure you've seen this picture. Homolo, homology. Oops, we don't mean that one. We mean this one. So I'm sure you guys have seen this this classic picture. Is my face in the way? It is. Hold on, I'll move this down a little bit here. There we go. So I'm sure you've seen this picture. Of course, where we have um, the the four limb of various organisms hanging out. Um, and, and the same homologous structures are, are highlighted. We've got the phalanges in purple, followed by the metacarpals, the, the, the regular carpals, the wrist bones, um, the, you know, in the, in the ankle, these would be the, the tarsals. Um, then we have the radius and the ulna, which make up, of course, the forearm. And then we have the humerus and, of course, the scapula. And this can be identified in any mammal. As, as far as I'm aware, and they've included birds here, and I mean, you can do so in, you know, the, there are, of course, slight novelties that emerge from a localized adaption um, and, and evolution of species to sort of live in specialized niches, but by and large, we find the same structures in organisms that share a common ancestor, interestingly enough. Now, of course, you hear, you frequently hear, well, um, it's not common descent, it's, it's common design. And that's all fine and dandy, but I do think that you might want to ask the horse if perhaps it was a great idea, a great design, uh, to have them sort of walking upon their toes like this, because they frequently can get a disease called laminitis. Laminitis, which is where the phalange actually goes through the bottom of the hoof, and gore warning, um, ends up pushing it um, through to the bottom, and it's an incredibly painful uh, disease that, that can indeed make a horse's life miserable, and I believe it can be lethal if bad enough because it hinders their ability to, to move around so much. Not a great idea. Um, of course, some of this is the fault of breeding, but 
we, we have plenty of other, you know, examples of, of sort of this basal structure, getting things done, but not necessarily being uh, the, the, the perfect design. I'm not saying that, that I'm not sort of precluding the idea that uh, there could have been an, a, a being to spur things in motion, but evolution is a self-contained process. So at least we know that it can be. Um, so let's continue. Fills the pages of our public school textbooks, standing out as the leading icon for human evolution. But is Lucy really a missing link to humans, or is she just an extinct three and a half foot ape? Stick around. Well, she's both. She is, of course, an ape, because we are, of course, apes. That therein lies the, the crux of the matter. You frequently see creationists sort of do things like this, whereas, if, you know, if we're looking at this horrible reconstruction of, of Lucy um, right here, this is from, I, I'm pretty sure this is from Answers in Genesis. They've got her, of course, knuckle walking, despite the fact that we know for certain that Lucy was a biped. And, and we'll discuss these reasons uh, so, sort of shortly. But mm, let's begin with a little bit of information about Lucy. So first of all, I'm, I'm not really sure that this is even an accurate face structure. This is almost more gorilla-like than it is. Oops, you can't see my cursor. Hold on, because I'm in OBS. Okay, here we go. Um, this is this is almost a bit more gorilla-like rather than chimp-like, um, which I, I, is probably intentional um, because the, the the gorilla sort of is is more more distantly removed from humans and it makes it easier to kind of dissociate, uh, which they're going to pull quite a bit here. Um, but anyways, we'll 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 touch on all of this momentarily. Let's continue. To find out. In 1974, Donald Johansson found a small elbow bone in the Ethiopian desert. Looking around, he found several other bones that looked like they could be from the same creature. He later returned to uncover hundreds of bone fragments scattered along a hillside. Later, his team pieced together the hundreds of fragments into 47 skeletal bones. They believed that the creature was an adult female that weighed 55 pounds and stood three and a half feet tall, not anywhere close to a human. But after gluing these hundreds of bone pieces into 47 parts and creating models of what they think the creature looked like, evolutionists came up with some surprisingly human-like creatures. Wow, how do you go from this, to this, to these? And they didn't even find any hands or feet with Lucy, and they certainly didn't find any eye whites, a feet- <laughs> Hold on there, cowboy. Um, let's let's sort of allow let's sort of allow this this sort of image to, to highlight. Hold on. Sure that only humans have. There we go. So, first of all, all of the the images that he's shown here, uh, just in the past couple of seconds, are modern reconstructions, right? These these weren't done like within even a decade. Mo I believe none of them were done in, in, in within a decade of finding Lucy. Um, and that's because he's right. There there were indeed various parts of Lucy that, that we didn't have. Um, I, I believe we had bits and pieces of the hands and feet, but certainly not the entirety. But the nice thing about science and the nice thing about paleontology is that it doesn't stop when you find one specimen. It continues. And since then, of course, we've, we've found numerous other specimens of Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, the Dakika child, I believe, is an excellent example. Um, Dakika child. I think Dakika is, is afarensis. It might be Africanus, actually. Let's see. No, nope, afarensis. That's what I thought. Excellent. Um, so really interesting neoteny here. Neoteny would be retained um, natal features. So the, the, one of the reasons why this skull here of the Dakika baby looks so human uh, is because it's actually a proposed hypothesis that, that partially what gave us some of our features is a biological process known as retained neoteny. It, it happened, the same thing happens to dogs when, when, you domest when we domesticate them from wolves. Um, and the way that we know this is that it happened when the, uh, there was the silver fox domestication experiment. Um, silver fox domestication experiment right here. Yeah, so essentially we had this Russian guy and he frequently bred uh, the most docile foxes together and he ended up getting foxes that displayed um, canid traits and they had much more retained neoteny. They retained their, their puppy, their cub traits well into to their adulthood and included these cute little floppy ears along with that nice disposition. Um, but I digress. My point here, what, what I was saying before I kind of went off the rails, which is one of the negatives of doing these, these kinds of things um, live, is the fact that we, we uh, 
we kind of allow me to, to ramble. <laughs> Unfortunately, or fortunately, if, if you guys like that kind of stuff, I'm going to need to get that feedback at some point. Um, but anyways, you, you, you can't blame people who do reconstructions uh, for reconstructing off of a specimen um, in a way that you don't like when they weren't necessarily tied to that particular specimen. Uh, most of the reconstructions that we have are done using multiple specimens uh, because as he noted, the Lucy specimen isn't entirely complete. Um, Lucy afarensis. Let's, let's have this up so that you guys can kind of see what we're looking at here. So uh, Lucy was a partial skull. This is a decent picture. It's quite large. Um, yeah, so we don't have hands and feet uh, but we have sort of a, a pelvis, we have the, the coccyx here, we've got most of the ribs, we've got a jaw, piece fragments of the skull, uh, both arms, and of course a leg. Now this is going to be really key here, this whole section right here, the, the, the sort of pelvis and downward, because this is what lets us know that Lucy is bipedal. Um, an, an excellent picture too is, is sort of here. Let's see if we can zoom in a little bit. Is it going to let us? Oh, no, I didn't want... Oh, wait, no, that, that'll work. That'll work. Let's see if you can see it. Well, of course, the button is covering Lucy's pelvis. Uh, we'll let it, let it, let our human pop up here. Lucy and chimpanzee share elongated skull with a small brain case. I believe this is California Academy of Sciences. I just want to see all of them, all three of them together so that I can show you guys and <laughs> flex my big knowledge muscle. Okay. So, as you can see here, we have very similar pelvises between uh, humans and afarensis, anatomically modern humans and afarensis, including this, this flared blade here. Um, and also, you'll notice that the, the, the femurs of the chimpanzee, they flare out to the side. Now, we, um, bipedal organisms, bipedal animals, have what's known as a valgus knee, which means that the knees angle inward, right, the, the, the femur angles inward via the femoral head um, and sort of the, the uh, epiphysis of the, of the bone where it connects with the, with the radius or radius, with the tibia and the uh, fibula in order to hold the weight directly underneath the body rather than splayed out to the side. And that's what allows us to walk for long periods of time and get our persistence hunting on. Um, interestingly enough, humans are actually way more efficient at this um, when compared to Lucy. I also want to point out, or afarensis in general, I also want to point out earlier when he, he, there was sort of a disparaging remark made about how Lucy's like three and a half feet tall. This is because there's a huge misconception by creationists when it comes to how <laughs> how things are supposedly getting bigger and better thanks to evolution. This is, of course, not the case. Things don't get infinitely bigger. That's not the goal, is to be larger. Um, if, if being larger is a benefit, that's great. You'll get larger. If it's not, you're not going to. That's why we still have small animals today. Now, I, I'm, I'm ready to talk about this. Um, because what he's saying here, and I'm going to back it up so you can hear it, because it's so dumb, um, it actually physically makes my stomach feel like it's filled with battery acid. And they certainly didn't find any eye whites, a feature that only humans have. And a feature that only humans have. That's interesting. Chimpanzee eyes. <laughs> to make her look more human-like. Well, no, they did it because this seems to be the evolutionary trend. Um, now, interestingly enough, what is the benefit of having eye whites, do you think, dear audience? Um, the answer is, the eye whites allow you to gaze track and gaze follow, which is incredibly useful for communication. It allows you to see where others are looking, um, sort of sort of uh, portray whether or not you're angry, friendly, happy, sad, um, making a threat. Um, the eyes, in combination with the eyebrows, are, are very important means of communication for, for primates because we're such we're so facially receptive to one another, um, which is super cool. So let's continue. In school textbooks across the country, Lucy is represented as a clear ape to human transition walking upright, holding babies, and gazing intelligently as she walks. This teaching sows seeds of doubts in the minds of Christian students, leading them to believe that the biblical creation account is based on far-fetched fantasies. But... So... <laughs> 
So the reason why Lucy is depicted as intelligent um, and, and bipedal is because she was intelligent and bipedal. That's the cool thing about the Australopithecines. That's why they're considered mosaics. Um, they, they had brain cases that ranged from like 350 to 500. Um, they, they, they had this incredible capacity uh, to leave traces that let us know that they walked and traveled in groups similar to, I mean, of course, most primates are group living animals, including humans. Um, but, but we know that Lucy um, or not rather Lucy, but other, other Australopithecus uh, afarensis members did carry their children kind of on their hip. Um, and the way that we know this is because when you're bipedal, you can't exactly carry your infant on your back as easily because baby chimpanzees and indeed baby gorillas and of course orangs and also bonobos, they use both their hands and their feet to clutch their mother's fur lest they fall off and be left behind or eaten by a predator or hurt just by hitting the ground. So if you don't have those hind feet, it's going to be quite a bit harder to, to actually hold on to your mother. And we also know that with these bigger skulls uh, comes, comes a birth that sort of uh, involves more development post-gestation. And what I mean by that is that there's more growing to do outside of the mother's body. That's why human babies are so helpless, and chimp babies, while not completely helpless, are, are more so than, say, lunar babies, um, which, which, is, which is fascinating. Another reason that we know that, that Lucy would have held her baby rather than, if she were indeed a mother, uh, rather than have the baby cling to her back, is because we find evidence in, in trackways, like the Laetoli footprints, where the, the, the female set of tracks, the smaller set, uh, is burdened on one side because there's a heavier weight. Now we know from hunter-gatherer tribes today that frequently when mothers hold their children, they do so by, by situating them on their hip. Um, so, so it wouldn't have been necessary, it's not necessarily a stretch to, to assume, or at least posit, that Lucy was indeed carrying her child and sort of moving her around um, as, as, or moving it around, we don't know the gender of the baby, <laughs> as, as they traveled in, in this new ash bed um, in, in a trio, which is fascinating. But let's, let's, let's continue, shall we? Uh, because Tate is being quite a dingus here, um, <laughs> which just drives me wild. My dudes, I had to refill on my tea uh, before, before we began this next section because I actually do remember what it, what it covers and what it's about. Um, and it's, it's probably one of my least favorite parts of this video. So I need to refuel um, in, in order to tackle this with all the strength and power that my primate ancestors have, have passed it down to me. Um, so so let's, let's tackle this and, and then I will, I will share with you my Thoughts. <laughs> really true. Is Lucy really our early human ancestor? Well, let's take a look at the evidence from head to toe. Starting with Lucy's skull, we really don't have much to go on. As leading paleontologist Dr. Leakey said, Lucy's skull was so incomplete that most of it was imagination made of plaster of Paris, thus making it impossible to draw any firm conclusion about what species she belonged to. When Lucy's actual skull bones are put together and the empty parts are filled in with what they imagine her skull looked like, she looks surprisingly similar to a modern bonobo. While we only have- Okay, so let's- let us stop there for a moment. Back it up, get a nice- a nice picture where we can see the two, uh, sitting side by side, just like this, and let's have a conversation. Because, yes, they do look quite similar. And the reason for that actually happens to, to, to be a prediction that was made by a solid percentage of the paleontologists and paleoanthropologists at the time of Lucy's discovery. Because you see, there was a debate going on. There was some academic infighting, as, as tends to happen in the wild realm of, of paleoanthropology, um, based off of which came first in human evolution. Was it the big brains? Or was it the bipedality? And essentially, the, the, the two sort of sides were feuding because there wasn't really much fossil evidence to go off of outside of basically Homo erectus, which, you know, was a biped and it also had a relatively large brain. Until Lucy. Until we have this, this incredibly enigmatic member of the Australopithecines, of Australopithecus afarensis, of course, um, with, with an excellent skeleton um, that, that looks something like this. 
here we go. This is a cool animation that essentially shows uh, how we think humans and chimpanzees compare uh, to sort of the locomotion styles of, of Lucy. This isn't actually what I was going for. I, I'm going to come back to this. But first, let's get a look at Lucy's actual uh, skeleton, um, fossil rather. Uh, right here we go. And there we go. Excellent. So what we have here is is some some very key, very important uh, sort of informative factors. Of course, we have the pelvis, which is excellent. Uh, we have an entire iliac blade, um, which which looks remarkably similar to a human's, especially when we compare uh, sort of in the animation when we can see them all side by side, which is flared to the side um, and and bowl shaped which is absolutely fascinating. They're going to reject or reject and object uh, to this to this sort of conclusion, but we'll, we'll reach that later. But we also have the femoral head down here. Now, this femoral head is very important because it lets us know the valgus nature of the knee. Um, we also have the, the end, the sort of epiphysis, this epiphysis of the femur, um, as well as uh, the, the, the bones that are sort of distal to the knee. So it lets us know how they fit together. Obviously, we don't have a patella because patellas, they, they're like one of the first things to disappear from a skeleton, uh, as well as the hyoid bone that goes in the throat. Um, but absolutely, this is an impeccable specimen. But it's not the only specimen we have. Uh, we, we also, of course, have the Dakika child, which tells us an impeccable amount um, about what the skull looks like and of course what it would look like so we've had the neonatic features here and we get all of the features that uh, that we sort of see in the replications and reconstructions of lucy by sort of aging uh aging up the dakika child now <laughs> they're actually quite conservative when they do this because this is quite this is a very human looking skull um in proportions outside of the brain case uh, but there are some very key factors that we must consider when we're actually evaluating um, the skull that they're that they're showing here. Because for one, they're only using the parts derived from from the Australopithecus afarensis specimen Lucy, and absolutely forgetting every other specimen that we have. But the and and of course all of the important bits that that allow us to to notice uh, the, sort of how important this specimen was and what it told us about the nature of our evolution, how we were indeed bipeds first, and we know that as I said from from the pelvis, from the knees, and also the location of the foramen magnum. That's the hole at the base of the skull. Um, now you can't see it in this picture here, but you can with the Dakika child because fortunately enough, it's found with. The, part of the vertebra coming out of the back. So we know precisely where this foramen magnum indeed is. They're going to reject that too, but we will get to that because fortunately there's a paper and we can look at the paper. Um, they reference it, but they obviously didn't read it because that's just the nature of things. But what I really reject here, what I really hate, is the notion that these two skulls are identical. I don't have extensive training in, in anthropology. I got a minor in it. But even I can tell you that these skulls are anything but identical. So let's go through some, some of the differences together. Of course, there's, there's a difference in brain case size. We've got a, a larger brain case over here on Lucy than we do over on a bonobo. There's much heavier brow ridges going on over here above the orbits, as well as increased prognathism on the bonobo when compared to Lucy. The ramus is thicker. That's, of course, the, the, the angle on the jaw where the mandible fits into sort of the socket up here. And reduced canines in Lucy, very, very reduced when compared to bonobos. What this suggests is that we're starting to see um, a, a reduction in sexual dimorphism, uh, mostly because of a lack of male competition. We also see a, sort of an, a, an oddity here in the zygomatics, which are sort of these arches that are on the cheekbones. There's differences in, in how the back of the skull dips down, the location of the foramen magnum. You could, you could go on and on and on and I'm just an amateur, and I can point all of these things out. Um, it, it's absolutely ridiculous to suggest that these that these organisms are are identical in their skull shape. But the thing is, is they are somewhat similar, and that's kind of the point. 
that's part of why, again, Lucy was so important to, to uh, paleoanthropologists at the time, because it allowed us to, to glean the fact that we were indeed bipedal before we had big skulls. And the, that bipedality was supported by the same exact fossil with the location of the foramen mag, or not that exact same fossil, the series of fossils that followed, including Lucy. The location of the foramen magnum, the valgus knee, the, uh, the, the, the pelvic like flaring of the iliac blades along with the arch itself, of the of the, the pelvis end of the feet um we see sort of the same thing in the vertebra it's it's absolutely incredible but they wouldn't know any of that because they didn't have didn't take the time to to look at it they didn't bother and that's what drives me absolutely wild is it, it's just an absolute um rejection of proper sourcing anyways let's continue <laughs> These actual skull bones are put together and the empty parts are filled in with what they imagine her skull looked like, she looks surprisingly similar to a modern bonobo. While we only have a few broken skull bones from Lucy, other skulls of Lucy's kind show that their spines entered into their skulls at an angle, just about like chimps, showing that she likely walked on all fours and not on two legs like humans. So it's very interesting that they choose to take that opportunity to kind of look into to the the other fossils. It's only when it's convenient. Um, but also that's that's a, a wholly um, poor premise, and, and it's simply untrue. So I'm going to go ahead and help us out here and, and pull up the paper so that we have access to it, um, because I've actually put it in my notes earlier. We can do a little control click here. What do we got? It's on NCBI. Oops, it's going to pull up in something else. Let me... Let me just do a little drop and drag, drag and drop, I mean, and put it over here. Now, the interesting thing is I had to actively seek this paper out because you'll notice on Genesis Apologetics video, Apologetics is video, um, there is no like sourcing going on here. This is, this is a, a ripped picture uh, ripped sort of sort of a figure from a paper and it's not listed here in the description either which is very poor form um, bad job Genesis apologetics you, you gotta source what you're what you're referencing so that other people can fact check you but then when I actually did manage to find the source because it has the exact same figure as I'll show you in just a moment um, I, I, I suddenly became very clear to me why they didn't bother to include it I believe that this is this is the one. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, firm and magnum position index and firm and magnum uh, orientation. So, my friends, we're going to need to put on our our big brain hats for a moment. Um, go go ahead and, and enter into science mode as we as we analyze this sort of table here. Uh, essentially, it lists several fossils. We have uh, Afarensis here, uh, Af Africanus underneath, and Boisei, which these are the paranthropines, um, and then Aethiopicus, and then of course uh, hominids, or homo sapiens rather, uh, troglodytes male, that's common chimpanzee, troglodytes female, that's a female chimpanzee, and then gorilla males and gorilla females, with all of these values for the foramen magnum position and the foramen magnum orientation. Now, as we know, the foramen magnum is the hole at the base of the skull where the spinal cord exits. So I'm going to use this, this lovely cello tape sort of wheel, if you will, to, to demonstrate this as well as my own skull so we can kind of see precisely what's going on here. So when we consider a position, if this is my skull to the side, right? Very small. <laughs> Your position is going to be whether it's located directly underneath or whether it's located more posteriorly on the skull. Whereas the orientation is going to be whether or not it's like this, like this, or like this. Now, in a human skull, of course, the orientation is going to be sort of more towards the front, right? Because our spines curve right up underneath, uh, and, and so we can essentially bear our weight underneath our bodies. Whereas for a chimpanzee or any kind of quadrupedal animal, it's going to be uh, angled more towards the back of the skull so that the, the spinal cord can come up into the skull and, and you know hold it like this at an angle. Us, them. Angle, angle. Position, where it is at the base of the skull. Are you with me? So let's look at some of these values, shall we? So these are three uh, Australopithecus afarensis specimens. I believe Lucy is AL4442, but I'm not sure. So let's check that. That actually might be the Dakika child. 
All right, Lucy, specimen number. Glad we checked, 288.1. Oh my goodness, it's actually not listed. That should just kind of go to show uh, just how many specimens we're dealing with here. They're probably dealing with the most complete skulls. Um, so we have a 24, a 19, and a 23. And we're going to compare that to humans and chimps. So humans are at about a 31, whereas chimp males are at a 12 and chimp females are at a 14. Then we look, when we look at the foramen magnum orientation, we have uh, our, our primary one up here, our number, numero uno at 16, or we have sapiens at negative eight, so that would be uh, the orientation going forward, versus pan troglodytes being at 18 and 20, respectively. So what does this actually tell us? Well, it tells us that with regard to the position, we're dealing with 24, which is a number that is indeed seven points away from 31 versus 10 points away from the female and uh, 12 points away from the male. So this is this this foramen magnum position is going to be closer to humans, whereas the foramen magnum orientation is going to be within the chimpanzee range at 16, uh, which fits into the range of, of uh, 18 to 20 and is fairly far from from negative eight but still within the range and still considered intermediate as it, as it is sort of moving gradually uh, in the opposite direction, away from our, our sort of female 20 and down, down again towards uh, sort of our, our true human negative eight. Keep in mind that when I say that it's within the range, we're talking error bars here. So obviously when I say 16 is within the range, I'm not saying 16 is between 20 and 18. Usually this is like plus or minus two or three points. Um, I'm, they probably say so in the paper, which I'll link below. So you can check to check for yourself and see if I'm, see if I'm uh, <laughs> off base here. But essentially where I'm actually getting this from is, is conveniently, as most scientists do, they have listed uh, sort, of a, sort of an analysis of this table underneath, um, which, uh-oh, that's not what I meant to do. I didn't mean to move that. I meant to be in this tab over here. Uh, in Australopithecus afarensis, the reconstructed angle of the BAO line is 14 degrees in AL 822.1 and 16 in AL 444.2, values that lie within the range of for, for other Australopith crania. The Australopith range is well below the range for our sample of modern humans, the mean value for which is negative 8. Again, the foramen faces anterior inferior, inferiorly. Sorry, but overlaps the low end of the range for chimpanzees. Girls are about 15% higher. Thus, in contrast to the day on foramen magnum position in which the Australopithecus afarensis are aligned with other Australopiths with modern humans. The data on orientation for the foramen situate the Australopiths in an intermediate position between modern apes, humans, and humans, uh, but closer to the former. So essentially they're saying what we just said. And the reason I know that is because I read the paper, um, which is interesting. Uh, it, it's a thing that you can do if you wanna be aware of the literature. Um, and, and that of course begs the question, well, why didn't Genesis Apologetics read this paragraph? It's right below the table. It's literally right, right here, um, plain to see for anyone. Uh, and the answer is, I don't know but I suspect shenanigans because that doesn't quite seem on the level to me if you're seeking out this graph. They, they even include the, the, those pictures uh, to bolster their point without actually seemingly understanding what, what an orientation versus position even are. Because as we said, there are two separate values we're dealing with here and indeed numerous species. It's actually interesting to look at how we have a difference between uh, the gorilla range, the chimp range, the human range, and then into the Australopiths with Africanus, Afarensis, Australopithecine, or not Australopithecine, sorry, uh, the, the Paranthropines, and of course, uh, the earliest Australopithecine, which is uh, Aethiopicus. It's all fascinating stuff, and it's all easy to find. This, is, this wasn't even behind a paywall. But we're kindly and generously going to give them the very, very large benefit of the doubt and proceed with suspicion uh, on, on the basis of these potential shenanigans. Uh, next, she's going to talk about a lot of like semicircular canal stuff with regard to balance and, and auditory capabilities of hominids. And um, they present this, this lovely well-meaning scientist here who's holding up a, a, an inner ear model of the semicircular canals. 
but he really does look like the guy that they used to show on like DVD previews where it's like you wouldn't download a car. It's like this is the guy that would download the car. This is the guy that would download the house. So, you know, we're, we're, I'm not trying to throw shade on him because he seems like a really nice guy. I'm just, you know, he seems like a guy who knows a little bit about torrenting, uh, domiciles and modes of transportation. So we'll let him, we'll, we'll let Genesis Apologetics uh, go on their merry way. Uh, well, we would if I were capable. Were. Dr. Spore, professor of evolutionary anthropology, has extensively studied the inner ears of various apes and humans. After studying Australopithecines, he revealed that the balancing system in their ears were the same as modern apes, enabling them to live in trees. Next, we have this vertebrae. You, you see how they do this? They go quickly. They try to overload your senses with, with numerous uh, boom, 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 here's a problem, here's a problem, here's a problem, to poke as many holes in the boat as possible, uh, or the ark as possible, uh, without letting anybody actually get in and refute. That's why the ability of pausing videos is lovely. Let's talk about the auditory, uh, the auditory capabilities of early hominins. Uh, we got a lovely paper here, imagine that, using literature to fight the, the, you know, the bad science of bad scientists, if you can, if you can charitably call them that. Uh, now, <laughs> when we see this, this just one paper recorded here in the, abstr the abstract, compared with chimpanzees, both early hominin taxa, both of the early hominin taxa, rather, both in reference to the Australopithecines and the Paranthropians, show a heightened sensitivity to frequencies between 1.3 and 3.5 kilohertz and an occupied band of maximum sensitivity shifted towards slightly higher frequencies. Uh, these are implications essentially for sensory ecology, and they basically suggest that, that these organisms are more adapted to, to open habitats rather than heavily arboreal habitats, which is already very fascinating. But it goes further than that. We've extensively studied the anatomy of the outer and middle ear and early hominin taxa in both Australopithecines and Paranthropines, and have found that their auditory capacities, um, compared with chimpanzees, the early hominin taxa are derived towards modern humans in their slightly shorter and wider external auditory canal, smaller tympanic membrane, and lower malus incus lever ratio, but they remain primitive in the small size of their stapes footplate. So this all makes pretty decent sense, because as we know, we are relatively firm in the hypothesis that bipedality came before uh, large brains. In fact, this is, this is pretty settled stuff. So it would make sense that the inner ear would evolve for, for uh, abilities to balance and bipedality prior to large brain case size, and that it would do so in sort of a stepwise fashion. So essentially we have the malice and the incus, two of the middle ear bones that are already sort of engaged uh, in, in this trend towards, you know, a modern anatomical modern human, whereas the stapes is still primitive. But more than that, it's also in reference to the, the actual eardrum, the tympanic membrane, and also the external auditory canal. So that's your actual ear hole that you can fit your finger into, which are all highly derived. So we've got... <laughs> Three, a four if you count both the middle ear bones as highly derived, and one that is more basal. And then we have, of course, a, a more derived uh, frequency of, of auditory sensitivity that's more derived towards modern humans because we lived in open savannas rather in, than in jungles. So the question is, now this was in 2015, and we know that um, Biddle and Bros released this on uh, July 30th in 2018. So the question is, why didn't they study the literature? You guys are getting at what I'm hinting at here, right? I don't think that they didn't link the literature, and this is one, I've linked one paper of both of these subjects. There's dozens. I'm not an anthropologist as much as I wish I were. Um, actually, I'd rather be a primatologist, but I'm on my way with that. But I've had enough training in this to, to be able to read papers of this nature and understand you know, what general trends we see in both anatomically modern primates and extinct primates are. That's, that's kind of like my deal. So I enjoy immensely reading papers on, on, on the subject. Uh, I just wrote a giant, massive, enormous, gargantuan literature review on the topic. So uh, trust me when I say it's not very difficult to find this stuff. Look, let's do, let's do a literature. Um, this is those who did my baby's first literature search. Google Scholar. Enter. Click on Google Scholar. There we go. Now let's say we want to talk about hominid locomotion. Hominid locomotion. Wow. Wow. Look at all those. Look at all these papers. You can even tailor 
your results to if you want something more recent. So this is 1996. You can also see how how many citations there are, so you can see you know kind of the impact. Of, of a given paper. So this has been cited by 354 individuals and see implication of early hominid labyrinthian morphology for the evolution of bipedal locomotion. Wait a second. Spore. Did you guys see that page unavailable? Hold on. Did you guys get that? Spore. That's the guy that, um, that our, our boys at Genesis Apologetics were just talking about. I wonder why it's unavailable. Let's see if we can't find it. Let's do a little a little live action investigation here. What do you think? I know you guys are absolutely thrilled with the idea of this endeavor. Nature. Yep, 1994 spore. Okay, so here's what's here's what's somewhat interesting, right? Remember how I said earlier or literally in any of my other videos that with literature you have to stay up to date on it? So when we're comparing this paper, right, from 2015 to one that was uh, over 20 years older, you might want to go ahead and lend credence to the original paper. So let's see who we're comparing here. Let's read our abstract. The upright posture and obligatory bipedalism of modern humans are unique among living primates. The evolutionary history of this behavior has traditionally been pursued by a functional analysis of postcranial skeleton and the preserved footprints of fossil hominids. Here we report a systematic attempt to reconstruct the locomotor behavior of early hominids by looking at a major component of the mechanism for the unconscious perception of movement, namely by examining the vestibular system of living primates and early hominids. High resolution computed tomography was used to generate cross-sectional images of, bony, of the bony labyrinth. Among fossil hominids, the earliest species to demonstrate modern human morphology is Homo erectus. In contrast, the semicircular canal dimensions in the crania for the southern African uh, species um, attributed to Australopithecus and Paranthropus resemble those of extant great apes. Among early Homo sapiens, the canal dimensions of STW53 are unlike those seen in any of the hominoids or the great apes, whereas those of SK847 are modern human-like. So, do you see what's going on here? Do you see the, the somewhat blatant either ignorance or dishonesty that we're seeing? We're talking about being modern human morphology. Demonstrate the modern human morphology. That implies they look precisely like those of modern humans. Uh, they're, they're, they're not saying trending towards, they're not saying um, so indicative of, you know, the sort of this uh, um, moving in a singular direction towards, they're saying resemble, or not even resemble actually, they're, they're saying, um, do they demonstrate modern human morphology? So essentially, any organism that's transitioning in this, in this reference to the semicircular canals, which of course, to be clear, are indeed very different from what's being spoken about here, which is covering the, the, the uh, tympanic membranes, so the eardrum, the auditory ossicles, which are the middle ear bones, and the auditory canal itself. So we're talking about different things, that's absolutely true. But notice also that there's no mention of, of arboreality and how this is indicative of an arboreal lifestyle. These are all presumptions made by Genesis Apologetics in order to, to bolster their case on the down low by saying, oh, well, they're, you know, the semicircular canals are more similar to those of, of uh, extant great apes, so they must have lived in trees. But that's strange, isn't it? Because there's one great ape that lives almost exclusively in the trees, that would be the orangutan. There's one that moves from the trees and to terrestriality back and forth, which would be chimps and bonobos, genus pan. Um, and of course, there's the gorillas who are almost entirely terrestrial. Is that not a bit odd to you guys? It's a little bit odd to me. Essentially, what I'm saying is at this point, I think, and this is going to be a little wild, so you're going to have to bear with me here, but I think maybe that Genesis Apologetics is lying and being intentionally dishonest in order to conceal the actual literature consensus in favor of their idea that humans did not evolve from, from other apes. I know, it's shocking. It's shocking. It's, it's definitely uh, stunning to the senses, but let's, let's continue in our journey and see what else we find that would perhaps support that. We're going to find more. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> ...that was believed to be part of Lucy for over 40 years. Recently, scientists learned that it was actually from an extinct relative of the baboon. Credit, credit where credit is due. 
that that piece of vertebra, I believe it was a cervical vertebra, uh, is indeed from a relative of the baboon. It's not from a baboon. They're from therapithecids. We have one living therapithecid today, and that would be the gelata, who are, they live on the Ethiopian highlands, and they are very lovely lads. They do this crazy thing with their lips where they show their canines like this um, to intimidate other members of the troop. They also have these crazy wild uh, chest patches, which they use to signal that for females, whether they're an estrus and for males, how fit they are, depending on how big and red, you know, these they're kind of appearing, which is why they're called bleeding heart baboons. Oops. Which I think is kind of cool. They're also gramnivorous entirely. They're the only gramnivorous monkey. That means all they eat is grass. So you're probably wondering, what, what's, what's with the big canines? And the answer is competition. Anyways, luckily for you guys, my, my modern, gentle primates, I have an excellent image that I'm going to show you that is going to really give you an idea as to why this entire issue, or rather non-issue, with the baboon vertebra is, is kind of a thing, right? Get that little copy paste up in here. What do you think? I'm getting excited. I love this stuff. I love good science. I love when people are doing good science. Uh, that's why I have to inoculate myself with good science prior to dealing with Genesis apologetics. So we've got a cool, um, sassy title here. Why Lucy's baboon bone is great for science and evolutionary theory. But shame on you, uh, Vin Hilton, because it's not technically a baboon bone. You never want to get something wrong that Genesis apologetics got right. That's a very low bar. We're talking in the basement and on the floor. Maybe even like a crack in the basement, so it's even actually lower than the basement floor. So... There's an image, this is a cool image, very similar to the one Genesis Apologetic shows, but it's not the one we're actually looking for. Here's some cool cervical vertebra, or sorry, thoracic vertebra. I should have known because it's humped. Cervical vertebra for the neck, thoracic or for the back. Um, so this is for her vertebral column. I also should have known because they show her, she's got her cervical vertebra, potentially cervical vertebra here, and then these would be the thoracic. Anyways, this is the paper that I'm, this is the picture I'm looking for. This is a, a very cool uh, diagram that shows why this is a non-issue. So these are the, the, the vertebra of numerous different primates, from sapiens, that's us, of course, to genus pan, your, your bonobos and your, your chimps. We've got uh, genus papio, that's the baboons, which is, you know, they're using baboons because it's probably a lot harder to get a, a gelata <laughs> vertebra than it is to get a, a regular baboon vertebra. You can't throw a rock without hitting one of them in most places in uh, rural Africa. Um, gorilla, etc. So this is very interesting, right? Because when we look at the comparison of the two, both with um, sapiens, it's, this is sort of a cross section, if you can't tell here. So this is Lucy right on the left side and sapiens, or rather the specimen on the left side uh, and sapiens on the right, and then Papio on the right versus um, the specimen on the left. And what they're basically showing us is two things. One, genus Papio vertebra and sapiens vertebra are very similar in morphology, even if they're different in size. But two, that AL228-1 is very similar to, is more similar rather to genus Papio than it is to modern sapiens. Now this would, this is how they knew, right? Because they're saying, okay, well, shoot, this looks pretty darn similar to, to a modern baboon vertebra, but let's double check. So then of course they check it with the ancient um, circopithecids that we have. Those are your ground apes, or ground monkeys, sorry. And they were like, wait a second. It looks like we've got a baboon uh, style animal vertebra on our hands, and it looks like it's probably a therapithecid. And that's how they figured it out. Um, very clever of them, by the way, because you'll notice how similar, this is why it was assigned to Lucy in the first place, you'll notice how similar it is. It's also great because this is an opportunity, as always, for modern science to change for what is correct. It's called peer review. And it's how we make sure we're not wrong forever. So long-term good thing, and it's probably honestly put the rest of Lucy's skeleton on much more, under much more intense scrutiny. So we can probably be fairly decently assured that the rest of the skeleton is legitimate at this point, legitimately owed to a single animal. For those of you who don't know, Lucy as a specimen is left to have died by falling out of a tree. And you might be saying, that's ridiculous. Um, that would imply that she was in a tree. And to that, I would say, absolutely. Organisms don't just quit one biome entirely in favor of another one. It's quite a slow transition. So Australopithecines, particularly Lucy, which would have lived um, in the northeast of Africa compared to Africanus, which lived in the south, 
probably has still lived in, in kind of sparse woodlands and would climb up into the trees to, to fetch certain things. Um, we know this because they, their toes, while not quite completely in line, are pretty dang in line, so they can't necessarily grasp anymore. They're more adapted to bipedality, but that doesn't necessarily mean they didn't spend any time in the trees. Um, I'm sure quite a few modern humans throughout history have also died from falling out of trees. Um, it's, it's our ancient primate urge. It's, it's unquenchable, the, the, the desire to climb up onto something high um, and then fall out of it, apparently. When Johansson first discovered Lucy's pelvis, he reported it was badly crushed with distortion and cracking. His team believed that it had been broken apart and then fused together during later fossilization, which caused it to be in an anatomically impossible position and to flare out like a chimp's pelvis. Their solution to this? Use a buzzsaw to cut it apart and piece it back together. After this pelvis reconstruction, they noted, it was a tricky job, but after taking out the kink of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Even evolutionists in the famous Human Evolution Journal have problems with this reconstruction, stating, We think that the reconstruction overestimates the width of this pelvis area, creating a very human-like sacral plane. Since 1995, evolutionists have been battling out Lucy's gender, with some even suggesting that male names like Brucey or Lucifer would better fit the fossil. Now, I actually know of no one who is suggesting that Lucy's sex is up for debate, uh, mostly because we have males of the same species that are quite a bit larger, suggesting obviously some sexual dimorphism going on, and we know that Lucy's an adult because she has her adult teeth. So, I don't know, I, I don't think that this so much applies that Lucy might be male, um, but, but like I said, it's, 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 we're dealing with a sexually dimorphic species. So the fact that the pelvis was crushed inward, first of all, as we know, he's going to mention this later, um, Lucy is thought to have died by falling from a tree, said that earlier, etc., etc., um, and she crushed her pelvis in the process. When they say it's anatomically impossible, um, the, the, how, how the pelvis was fitting, um, that really is a, a viable excuse. You can look up pretty decent pictures of the original pelvis. The, the, the anatomical, um, sort of, uh, I guess, how the organs would fit together within the abdominal cavity wouldn't have worked with the way that the pelvis was before they broke it apart and, and put it back together. Plus, fortunately, when bones fracture, they leave marks that they have indeed fractured, uh, even when they mineralize. This is how we can tell things like that dinosaurs broke a limb and then, you know, healed it. Um, Sue, the tyrannosaur that's, that's located at the Chicago Field Museum, ha had several injuries, and we can tell because it is recorded in the bone, like I said earlier. Um, the, you know, it's, it's not like we're going in blind with this stuff. The, the, the pelvis was reconstructed so we can get an idea on what it truly looked like, because the original form wouldn't have worked for, for any organism. Even if it were chimpanzee-like, it wouldn't have worked, because the, the head of the femur wouldn't have been able to fit inside the, the socket known as the acetabulum. So it's, it's not that it's chimp-like, it's that it's impossible. Uh, that's, that's, kind of the idea. That's that's why they were harping on that so much. I'm stuttering because I'm just so much at a loss for this. I have no idea why we're still, I do, I do, I do know why we have an idea. It's money, why we're still having this conversation. Money and, and very, very powerful delusion. Um, I realize that's very harsh, but with these guys, it's got to be one or the other. It's got to be ignorance or it's got to be intentional. I, I it, it's not possible that these people are intentionally looking for the information with regard to things like Lucy's pelvic reconstruction and are not finding it. I don't believe that. So let's, okay, well, well <laughs> oh man, I'm already sick of this. Let's let him keep going. Chris, when looking at a cast of Lucy's bones, experts at George Washington University revealed that her wrist was stiff like a chimpanzee's. This enabled Lucy... Pause, 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 pause. Hold on. Look at, look at the differences here. First of all, notice that the chimp and the human are the most similar in size. Now, this could be due to degradation, but also notice just how intermediate this, this system actually is, that this, this sort of socket looks. Now, them putting little brackets here to kind of make it seem like these two are similar and this one isn't shouldn't, should not uh, distract from the fact that they're really all three very much, very much in common. Look at look at these ridges here and here, if you can see my mouse. Um, they're lacking in Lucy's. 
Um, this is this is kind of again what you would expect from an organism that is transitioning from being either a knuckle walker or an arboreal or uh, quad arboreal quadruped quadruped sorry um, to being bipedal. You're going to lose these traits somewhat slowly. They're not going to disappear all at once. So doesn't it seem more compelling than anything else that we've got this in between right here and Lucy's? Look at the features that it lacks from the chimpanzee. It, this was not quite smart of them to put this up here. Anybody with, you know, two working uh, eyeballs and optic nerves and a brain can see that they're all, they all share similarities and, and one, if any of them sticks out, it's Lucy, not the chimps or the human. Um, let's continue. Lucy's wrist to lock in place for knuckle walking, just like most apes today. Oh, they're cute. Another study noted, measurements of the shape of wrist bones showed that Lucy's type were knuckle walkers, similar to gorillas. Even the fingers of Lucy's kind have been shown to be curved and ape-like, best suited for swinging in trees. Did you guys know... It, this this was something my my human evolution professor taught us. He showed two pictures up on the screen. They were two hands. I wish I still had the the picture. Um, they were and there were X rays of two hands on our PowerPoint projector. Um, projector PowerPoint. You get what I'm saying. And in one of them, there were curved fingers, right, similar to what we see in the bottom left here. And in the other, there were straight fingers, the phalanges. And he asked us, obviously, which, which one's the human and which one's which one's the chimp. And as you would expect, everyone was kind of like, all right, it's probably a trick question. <laughs> so go ahead and tell us who's who. And he informed us that the curved fingers belonged to a human gymnast and the straight fingers belonged to a chimpanzee that had been raised in captivity and not been allowed to exercise its arboreality. So really and truly curved, bone has the ability to adapt to lifestyle to a degree. It's, it's not, you know, a set trait necessarily. I, if you look at the skeleton of a, of, a, of a baby chimpanzee, the fingers aren't curved. It's just, or if, if they are, it's very slight. So I, this isn't convincing at all. This is not an actual argument. It's, it's a non sequitur. It doesn't follow. And anybody who knows anything about, you know, plasticity with regard to anatomy would know that. Which is why Tate doesn't know it. There seems to be a trend here uh, with not knowing things and our host. And it's that they're one and the same. Tate doesn't know anything. He's, he's reading off of a script here uh, that was handed to him by someone who probably also didn't know too many things. I realize I'm being very harsh. This is my wheelhouse, though. So hearing blatant disregard for even cursory research... It pisses me off a little. It, it, it boils my blood, all right? It, it just kind of dicks me off a bit. So let's, let's keep moving. Next, we have Lucy's short little legs. Oh. Bill Jungers at the Stony Brook Institute in New York argued that Lucy's legs were too short in relation to her arms for her species to have achieved a fully modern adaptation to bipedalism. Here we go now again. Here we go again. This is, this is once more in a perfect shining example of not understanding or intentionally uh, screwing up the wording because you see it here says fully modern adaption to bipedalism. Sony Brook is an excellent university with regard to anthropology. So, you know, first of all, I highly doubt that they would be releasing something so controversial with regard to Lucy, but second of all, the wording doesn't even match it. You know, it, this, this is essentially saying the same thing when we were talking about the auditory, the, you know, the auditory, um, uh, system, the mechanisms of hearing. Of course, it's not fully modern. You, you think that you're going to achieve if you modern human efficient bipedality in like two to three million years, it's not going to happen. Of course, Lucy wasn't, it didn't have perfectly anatomically modern bipedalism, which is what they're saying here. This is clever, uh, misrepresentation of the words and they even put them up the weird thing is is they put them up here for everyone to see and it it makes me mad it's so blatant it's so blatant in other words she wasn't built for walking other researchers have concluded the same thing in, in other words in other words the exact opposite of what was just said Lucy's legs were too short in relation to her arms for her species to have achieved a fully modern adaption to bipedalism. What that means is her bipedality was what? Transitional. 
I, I wonder if we looked at the rest of the quote what it would reveal. We could look it up, but, but I'm honestly already getting sick and tired of this video, and I really want to get it over with. While a knee joint was not even found with Lucy, a different knee that was found one year earlier had been used to try to prove that Lucy walked upright. This other knee was found over 8,000 feet away from where Lucy was found, and over 200 feet deeper in the ground. Johansson's lead team member said this knee was human, not Abe. Most recently, a team mm, of scientists... Mm, mm, mm. No, we're going to talk about this. Let me, let me get, my, let me get my, my equipment all set up here. Hold on just a second. Hold on just a second. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Uh, what are we at here? 4.30? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, oh man. The thing, the thing that's so difficult with this is that Tate seems, and Genesis Apologetics in general, they seem to completely disregard the fact that we have other specimens of Australopithecus afarensis. We have the Dakika child and we have, uh, I'm gonna, I pulled it up because I'm going to, to mispronounce it. It's a quite large secondary partial skeleton called a Kadanumu. Kadanumu means big man in the Afar language. Let's, let's hold on. Let's copy this guy right here so we can, so we can look at it. See for ourselves this, this fake knee that everyone's been talking about. And then I'm going to pull something up for you that I think is quite nice. If I can make it, if I can get it to pull up. Ah, excellent. Yeah. Ooh, that, that was actually a better one. This one's nice. Yeah, so. Right down here. So you can see right here, right? Look at the angle. You see the angle of this femur? That's a valgus knee. The fact that it's angled like that is so that the organism can, again, hold the weight directly underneath the body. This leads to efficient locomotion. Now, again, it's not going to be perfectly modern because Lucy still had a ton of characteristics that were deemed, you know, traditionally more basal. But this knee, this is an excellent, an excellent example. Furthermore, Lucy's skeleton, while it doesn't have both parts of the same knee, please pop up, please. This is classic. Okay, here we go. Well, it doesn't have both parts of the same knee. It has two parts of the opposite. So we have here the tibia and a little piece of the fibula and then the femur over here. And what does it show us? A valgus knee once more. You can also tell quite a bit by how the femoral head fits into the acetabulum. The, these are traits that I've said and I'm having to repeat because Tate keeps using the same example in slightly different ways. Um, Lucy doesn't have a, we don't have a full skeleton of Lucy, so therefore we can't tell anything about Australopithecus afarensis. It's like he thinks every new specimen is in and of itself a new species. Um, it's like it, it's like that, but then obviously it isn't because when it's convenient, he'll bring up uh, other members. The nice thing about this uh, Katamundu, 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 something like that, um, this specimen here, right, is that we also have bits and pieces of the arm. And of course the rib cage and the, the vertebra, this is how we actually, part of how we knew that that one vertebra was from a, therapeuth a therapeuthocene, and how we know that Lucy is um, from a sexually dimorphic species. So that's all fine and dandy. Very cool, Inter very cool, Kanye. Interesting stuff. All right, let's see here. Let's see here. Mm -mm -mm. Get back to the video so you guys can suffer with me. This from the University of Texas conducted 38,000 scans of Lucy's bones. After researching the different breaks and fractures, they concluded that she died while falling over 40 feet out of a tree while she was awake. <laughs> I really like that animation. Um, yes, we've, we've mentioned this previously. Um, while she was awake, I guess that's him basically saying uh, she fell out of the tree uh, because she was, what, a, a bad ape? She was bad at being in the trees? That seems a little bit counterintuitive to what he's actually trying to say. Um, but yeah, this is kind of this was a neat actual study that they did where they figured out how Lucy perished. Even trying to break her fall, Lucy, a little three and a half foot, fifty five pound ape that supposedly walked on two feet like a human. Supposedly, human died by falling forty feet out of a tree, made of hundreds of bone fragments glued together to make forty seven parts. Even accidentally. Uh, okay, I see. I see. Vertebrae I see. So species. the. Do we really know what she was? Oh God. Her skull, inner ears, locking wrist, curved fingers, and short legs reveal that she was... There we go. Um, yes, she did, again, die falling out of a tree, which is 
40, 40 feet out of a tree, which is pretty high up, but I know humans who have died falling off much higher perches. Um, and we find humans all the time who have died from weird blunt force injuries. Organisms are strange, primates are even stranger, um, and, and they have all sorts of different lifestyles, from arboreality to terrestriality. I, it wouldn't surprise, I mean, there are more than enough anthropologists who suggest that, that Australopithecines still did spend time in the trees. Their shoulders are certainly capable of pulling them up there, but their toes wouldn't have been very good at grasping because unlike this absolutely trash tier brainlet level reconstruction, this is not what Lucy looked like. And the, again, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know why I have to keep repeating this. I'm repeating it for you, but I'm also repeating it so that I feel like I'm not losing my marbles. Lucy's traits, her characteristics, the ones that we do have indicate bipedality, but moreover, the characteristics of other specimens that belong to her species reinforce that fact. Same with Australopithecus africanus, same with Australopithecus anamensis, same with Ardipithecus uh, ramidus and aurora tuganensis and Ardipithecus cadaba and Sahelanthropus. All of these have this beautiful gradient of having adaptions to bipedality, each slightly more efficient than the next. And the way that we can tell that they're efficient or not is by plugging all those bones into a sort of a lattice structure when we plug it into our computer and run locomotion studies on it and see how they walk. Um, this is, this is empirical advanced science. They like to think that this is, you know, that this is all made up stuff and, and plaster of Paris and things like that, which by the way, I didn't actually cover this when he was talking about it, but that, you know, he, he says that that's a quote from Leakey. He doesn't mention which Leakey it is. Uh, it's actually Leakey the Younger, Leakey Jr., so to speak, um, who was quoted, he was essentially quoting that plaster of Paris ideas kind of characterize what the public thought of what they were doing. Um, so, so again, things taken out of context over and over and over again. He's just going to list all of the things that he already said. Definitely an ape. But that's not what evolutionists want you to think. Shown with human expressions, I... Uh, again, white sclera, we've already been through this. ...whites, which no apes have, nope. and walking upright. Wrong. They want you to think she was on her way to becoming human. They want you to believe that there are hundreds of Lucy's kind buried in the earth. As in this video, where Johansson explains there are 400 Australopithecine specimens and marches an army of hundreds of complete skeletons across the screen. He really doesn't like that video. He's got a huge, huge, huge sort of sort of hate, uh, I mean, you can't really use that phrase, or I'm gonna get demonetized. Hate rhymes with loner for, for this particular video with uh, Donald Johansson and all of the specimens. He's mad that all the, why can't all the specimens be full skeletons? If they're not, they don't count. Um, not quite. Uh, Tate, not quite Genesis apologetics. Um, the, the same type of science that we use to reconstruct varying hominids we use in forensic anthropology and in criminology to solve real crime cases in, in, the, in the modern actual world that you inhabit today. But what he doesn't say is that he's talking about 400 bone specimens, not individuals, and 35% of these specimens are just teeth. You guys see this? You guys see this, uh, this, this paper right here? Let me tell you a little something about this paper. You notice how there's not a date on it? You notice how you can't find the date? Um, and you notice how they, again, just, just for your information, don't link it? Well, as, as any good, you know, scientist in training does, I went ahead and, and, you know, sought the paper out. I found it, and it was published in 2009, almost a decade before this video was published. So the question is, Given how exponential our discovery of varying fossil hominids are, how many more do you think we've found since, since this 2009 paper, do you think? Huh? Um, quite a few, I would imagine, uh, particularly because when I took uh, human evolution in, in 2016, my professor specifically said to me, he was like, yeah, a lot of people tend to sit on their specimens for quite some time because they're trying to get as much data out of it as they can before they release um, so that they can kind of you know, have an opportunity to monopolize the data, which is fair. I would do the same thing. But it, I just think it's quite funny that he intentionally doesn't include the date here. Usually the date is like right above the title too, or right below. So it feels a little intentional. It feels a little suspicious. And fewer than a dozen are skulls, all of which have been pieced together using numerous broken pieces. 
Here is a picture showing the majority of this entire collection, sitting on top of a... This is a picture from this paper in 2009 for a video in 2018. Keep that in mind. ...single table. If human evolution really happened over millions of years, wouldn't we expect to find more? With over... We are incredibly lucky to have the fossil record that we do. The, the fossil record with regard to, to Sahelanthropus to modern chimps is absolutely abysmal because the, the, the habitat that they lived in simply wasn't conducive to it. And yet you can't throw a rock without hitting a hand axe if you're an old Levi Gorge. We, we are inundated with evidence of, of this, this, <laughs> this zero right here and this blurred out cube of, of hominids um, that is absolutely sickening to look at. For these, first of all, these are kind of horrifying models. Uh, but second of all, this this is just such a gross mischaracterization. Um, Tate really isn't a fan of, of admitting that he is indeed an ape. Because, he, you know, he, he just is rehashing these same points uh, a second time. So I guess almost to remind you to say, hey, did, did, you, did you not hear me the first time when I said one of them was a, a, a baboon? Did you hear it was a baboon bone? Oh my god, baboon relative. Um... No, we did. We did hear, and, and we did take note. I took note um, of, of quite a bit of it. it the, the fact that we've got the fossils that we have again is spectacular, particularly all the well-preserved skulls. Um, and and I, I just think of all the hard work that so many paleoanthropologists have put in, all for, for an individual, you know, to, to, for Dan Biddle to create Genesis Apologetics and, you know, have hundreds hundred thousand subs and, and to publish a video like this and then seven very similar videos um, and release them in quick succession you know and he's monetized too and the way that I know that is I keep getting um keep getting ads I keep getting that same ad for uh, taking Hebrew lessons which I don't think I would be very good at now another thing that's important to consider is that there are billions of modern humans um, you this, this kind of population that we are sustaining right now has not always been the case by a long shot. Our species has not been particularly large in the past uh, in, any, in any iteration, from the Australopithecines to, to Homo erectus. Well, Homo erectus. There were a lot of Homo erectus, but certainly not as many as there are Homo sapiens. So comparing population numbers is just dumb. It's just stupid. You think you're going to take, you know, whatever, 8 billion people seven, eight billion people, and say, well, look at all these people now. How come we don't find just as many hominid bones? Well, because there were never that many. There's probably more people now than, I, I don't, actually, I don't know if you could say that. I was going to say there's more people now than hominids ever um, of any other, of any other, like, kind, species kind. You see what I did there? Of any other genera. But I don't know that you can say that either. Um, I don't know the numbers well enough. You see, you know, you guys know I don't, I try not to talk out of my field. Um, but, you know, he's, he's just so off base here. This just shows such a basic lack of understanding of population genetics. Um, and you also notice, you'll probably, you'll probably be aware of the fact that the only hominid that creationists seem capable of talking about are, are Australopithecus afarensis and the Indertalensis. Um, why? I don't know. Probably because wouldn't it be a little suspicious if they looked at all of them and then people had access to one by one a, a debunking of each and every hominid and then they step back and they said wait a second this kind of looks like a like a gradient a gradient of traits almost a sort of evolution if you will <laughs> oh my goodness all right let's continue seven billion humans alive today shouldn't the ground be filled with transitions of apes still evolving into humans even Darwin realized that this was a problem by stating, As by my theory, innumerable transitional forms must have existed. Why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the earth? You know what's so really just what's, what was Luther You know what's really cool about that that quote is that that quote was made before the first specimen of Archaeopteryx lithographica was found. And it was actually found, you know, in, in Europe. I believe it was Germany, the first specimen. Um, and when Darwin got he got to lay his eyes on that transitional fossil and saw his theory vindicated during his lifetime. How lucky, how incredible. That's, that's, that's timing of the utmost importance. Um, so, so again, we see this mischaracterization using a quote by Darwin that was 
before we actually had transitional fossils, before we knew what we were looking at. Um, and you can check this for yourself. Archaeopteryx lithographica, for those of you who don't know, is, is the famous bird to di or dinosaur to bird transition. Um, I've seen the actual fossil myself. I've had the absolute pleasure of seeing it uh, here in the uh, Natural History Museum of London. The same one Darwin saw. I've also seen some of his pigeons, his stuffed pigeons, uh, which is really cool. Uh, litho, oops, lithographica. Please don't look, please. Graphica, damn it. Spelled it wrong. Yeah, so it's not this one. This is the most famous specimen. It's got most of the feathers intact, uh, and you can see it really quite well. I'm trying to find the one that I've seen. Uh, let's see here. Let's go with London. <laughs> yeah, here it is. And they've got both the halves of the of the fossil split in half. It's really, really neat. Um, look, you can see the feathers on the tail. You can see the opposable claw. Um, there, there are so many varying traits of so bony tail, but fully developed wings. Very, very cool stuff. Um, vindicated Darwin's, Darwin's theory in his lifetime. Lucy. The answer is straightforward. Lucy and other Australopithecines are extinct apes, just like many other ape species that have gone extinct. They are. They are extinct apes. Um, just like we are extant apes. Tate has a problem with this. A lot of creationists, I think, don't like the idea of being an ape. Um, I think it's also that they that they valid they, you know they value scripture and they think they interpret it literally and and think that that suggests that we aren't but i think it's also this weird identity identity crisis almost that we're you know of the same of the same order of the same uh uh genus or sorry not genus well yeah genus of many of the apes that have lived but but we're just we're all we're all a part of the same kind of kind of group of organisms and that kind of makes it difficult to continue your life while so many of these primates are heavily endangered because of the things that we do um, by the things that many evangelical conservatives are cool with voting for. Um, politics. <laughs> she walked on all fours, ate the foods that apes eat, and lived among other animals that are similar to those that... We eat the foods that apes eat because we're apes, but also we eat the foods that other hominoids eat. We eat fruits and, and varying different kinds of leaves and nuts and seeds and things like that. Also, it's convenient that he leaves out the part where many apes also are, are uh, omnivorous when they get the opportunity. This is dumb too. 87 other animal types, including ancient elephants, antelope, rhinos, hippos, and numerous other African native animals were found near Lucy. Why, why is this point being brought up? This is this does nothing but further validate that that Lucy was an organism that was bipedal and living in the savanna environment. Hence, in part, bipedality. Live around apes today. The truth is, God created. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, just a second. Hold on, you guys. Look at the whites of those eyes. He even this this gorilla even looks at this. <laughs> Am I taking crazy pills? Who authorized this? Why did they think this was a good idea? They just got done saying that no apes have whites in their eyes, and then they show a video with a with the silverback, with the whites and the. Oh my god! I feel like I just busted a busted a pulmonary. I feel like I just got an embolism. Oh my god, have I died? And gone to some horrific purgatory where no one edits their videos? God created land animals on the sixth day of creation, right before he created man to rule over them. We were created in the image of God, and not in the image of apes. Again, it's hard to say we're not in the image of apes when we are apes. No, no creationist has ever ever given me a good reason as to why humans aren't considered uh, not just primates but also apes in fact creation.com even is is chill with this they're chill with the idea that we're mammals and we're primates um i don't know why these guys have such like a such like a disdain for 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 their heritage but i do i do know i've already gone over it i, I say i don't know because i'm trying to give them an out out of the dust of the earth, and given the dominion charge to rule over all of God's creation. That's why we put apes in the zoo, and not the other way around. Humans are vastly different than apes in so many ways, many of which were made plain in this video. Our brains, however, stand out as the biggest... 
Yes. The brains are an important portion of this. The, the, the brain case is a very large difference between um, modern members of genus Pan, from Pan Peniscus to Pandroglodytes, and modern humans. Um, but the cool thing is, right, we have this very straightforward gradient of, of brain case uh, increases through the fossil record through geologic time. Uh, so, so that's kind of a great, a great jumping off point to look into this stuff. Um, plus, these, these organisms, they have the same dental formula, they have the same um, general structure of, of the brain with regard to the lobes and which parts do which things, um, sharing 99% of coding base pair DNA. Um, really the biggest difference, honestly, like if you're just looking at straight morphology and not exaggerations of existing, is humans have a chin. No other hominids have that. In fact, no other animals have that. Um, I'm not quite sure what it's for. It, I've heard some ideas that it might be for like anchoring our lips a bit, just because we're such a linguistic species. Distinction. Being nearly three times larger than they should be based on our lineup with similarly sized apes. So again, I'm not sure why he's mentioning this. This is like, this is like the dumbest shit I've seen in my life. I'm not kidding. I, why are we bringing up aspects that are covered by human evolution by its very nature. Why? Right? I mean, the evolution of the brain case size is like partially why we look to the other apes, right? Because they have similarly large brain case sizes for, for their actual body mass. That's a trait that all primates have. Like, he seems to not understand. Obviously, he doesn't understand this. This is an excellent comparison, actually. When you see um, primate brain weight comparison, with, of course, they're comparing the weight. Probably, I'm hoping that they're statistically taking into account the body size to come up with these numbers. Um, human brains are 2.7 times larger than expected. Yes, that's our novelty. If only we had a gradient of fossils through geologic time showing how we made those steps. If only we had organisms from around 350 with modern chimpanzees to 1,200 approximately with humans, if only we had, we're going to upset 400, 500, 550, 600, 700, 900, 1,100, and 1,200 with us. Oh, wait, and then we go above and beyond with the Neanderthals, don't we, when we go it up to, we get up to 1,400 and 1,600. Um, so, so why this is brought up is beyond me, really. I'm just doing a little bit of nay-naying here on Genesis Apologetics because this is the this is so dumb. I don't know why we're bringing it up. Our brains are also wired completely differently than apes in so many ways. No, they're not. He's saying that and then he's pairing it with this slide here that says speaks one million plus words, speaks zero words, which by the way is also not true. Um, when when primates are taught primates, when when uh, hominoids are taught sign language, they can understand up to three three thousand, four thousand words um, and comprehend them, which is pretty good considering the disparity between the sizes of brain here. Um, but also keep in mind that this just looks like a mini version of this, right? I mean, it's, it is pretty impressive. Um, wired differently? No, hardly. Humans were wired by God with the intellect to rule the earth, just as we were commanded. We sing, worship, have ceremonies, pray, educate ourselves, and do so many other things that reflect the fact that we are spiritual beings and not animals. No, we, we are animals. We, <laughs> we kill, we hate, we hunt. We forage, we cooperate, we tolerate, we mate. We, we do all of the things that animals do in different ways and in, in completely, differ, completely different reasons sometimes. But we do all of those things nonetheless. It, it, I really can't fathom why this, des this attempt feels so desperate to me. Um, I think it's just because he's gone through all of this, all of this evidence um, that makes up like this teeny tiny portion of what we actually have with regard to anthropologic literature which is like this right and then he comes to this conclusion i mean we can go through the rest of this video i'll probably let it play um but you know also talking about all these things that that apes are not capable of doing with this bonobo sitting here looking like the, a dumb idiot or something next to the humans doing various things I really think he would be surprised to read some of the papers I've read. The great apes mourn their dead. You know, they laugh when they're tickled. 
They outperform us in short-term memory tests. You can look up some really cool stuff with uh, Kanzi, the bonobo, on this. And they form their own phrases in sign language. They can, they can actually combine two words. Um, gibbons can sing these elaborate duets to one another um, because for the most part they're pair bonded, they're monogamous. Um, and vervet monkeys are capable of lying and cheating and stealing and faking out their con specifics in order to get an, one, get an, get an upper hand on resources. And um, it, I just, I just think it's so sad that that they they can't seem to grasp that everything humans do is essentially just a modified version of what the other primates do, because we're primates and we're we're catarines and we're we're hominoids. So and and I find that incredibly cool and liberating and awesome and fascinating. And and these guys, I guess, seem to think of it as some kind of insult, which. You know, I don't know. I mean, even our social structures are like just these these existing modified versions of, of what we used to see in, in the other hominids and indeed what we see in living hominoids. Um, it, it's just it's just a big bummer. Following the genealogies in Genesis leads us back to the spontaneous creation of Adam on the sixth day of creation, just about 6,000 years ago. Then, about 4,400 years ago, the world was destroyed by a flood. Okay. 100 years later, humans were scattered around the world from the Tower of Babel. That's why we have so many different people groups today. We were just one race of people, but with minor variations based on the genes each group took from Babel. And at this, the same is true, but but with multiple pulses of leaving Africa, um, not based off of even races. We were separated into species, varying species based off of these pulses. Uh, races came far after, you know, Homo sapiens had gained supremacy over all of the other uh, existing hominins at the time. Adaptations that have occurred since. Just like the Bible says in Acts, and he has made all nations of men of one blood to dwell on all face of the earth, ordaining four appointed seasons and boundaries of their dwelling. It's important to understand the significance of these two contrasting worldviews. Public schools teach students that they evolved from apes, and when they act like it, we hold them accountable like spiritual beings with a conscience and morality. Yes, we do do that. I'm not really sure why they're... What I guess the idea is that they're saying that we, we tell them that they're animals, but we treat them like spiritual beings. Um, no, we treat them like organisms that are capable of following a moral code, one that's set by the consensus of the societies with which we live in. That's why different things are wrong and right in different cultures. Um, there are some generalities, like for instance, you don't want to lie, you don't want to cheat, you don't want to steal, and you don't want to kill. Those, those are pretty typical across most cultures, and interestingly enough, we see all four of those things um, present as, as sort of societal taboos in, in primate cultures. And if vervet monkeys are caught too many times lying, they get punished by the, the alpha males and females of the group because they get, and it becomes a cried wolf scenario. And usually that individual will reap consequences either in reduced access to resources or they get eaten by a predator because no one believes their calls. The organisms that kill and, or rather primates that kill and cause, cause problems usually get ganged up on by other, by other individuals. If you get an alpha male that's doing poorly and say geladas, females will gang up on him and kick him out. So, so... We see these societal rules on a much larger scale, obviously, than humans, but, but morals have a natural root, by and large, uh, or at least they very much seem to. Such a contradiction. The biblical account makes much more sense that we are a special creation of God, created in His image to rule over the earth and to know and love God and our fellow man. I like that they show this guy, like, like in the woods, like he just looks like a hominid, like, foraging out there. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? See more on this topic and others at Debunk Evolution. We're done. Oh, we're done, finally. Oh, thank God. Oh, God. Whew, okay. Wow. I need to take some blood, pre some blood pressure medication after that. Um, DebunkEvolution.com. I mean, all in all, the video's dreadfully uninformed. Um, and evidently it didn't even bother to do like the least bit of research with regard to even some of these topics that are incredibly basic with regard to Australopithecus afarensis. Um, for instance, why mechanisms are the way that they are in certain hominids or how lineages are proposed or why we can tell a lifestyle from a fossil find. Um, and I feel like a lot of times this video is like just doing this, this, this 
very poor job of representing not only its own argument, but the other side's argument, uh, which is, you know, that's not, that's not entirely, like, unusual for, for creationists. Um, I find that is fairly common in, like, videos by Answers in Genesis and stuff. But many times in this video's uh, kind of duration, whilst I was doing sort of a personal vibe check, I realized um, how difficult it would actually going to be to cover, you know, all of this information and have to continuously correct it when the explanations are so much longer than, than the misinformation, hence the gish galloping. Um, and, and, you know, I had to stop and look up all the graphics to see if they were actually, you know, talking about something that was legitimate and not a single time were they talking about a legitimate factor and representing it fairly. Um, so is Tate dishonest? You know, is, is answers, or not answers in Genesis, is Genesis apologetics dishonest? Um, maybe. Maybe. But there's also the possibility, as we must always allow for, that these guys are genuinely too lazy or dumb to actually look this stuff up and portray a scenario um, in an honest and in an informed light. Um, and I don't know which one is worse. So, I hope this was enjoyable for you guys. I, um, I'm exhausted. I feel like I need to go to sleep for, like, 16 hours just to recover from that. And I feel like I got my blood drawn, like, two times in quick succession. And that's how I'm feeling dizzy and, and disoriented by, by all of the, um, intentional or not, all of the stupid. Um, anyways appreciate you for sticking along with me, and I hope that we can do this again sometime. I'll see you next time, my gentle and modern apes, and you can find your, your resources below, and I do encourage you to check them out. Um, let me turn this OBS thing off. Oh, I was leaning over for, like, that whole time. You could probably, like, barely see my head. Oh my god. Okay, look at that. Dang it, why didn't I record the whole video like this? Well, I'm not doing it again, so you're just gonna have to deal with my disembodied head telling you all about all about this um see ya